Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about gas to liquid or GTL technology. So let's dive right into it. Now, what we are talking about? We are talking about gas. Which gas? Methane gas or generally known as natural gas or biogas. Now, you have to understand one context of it. Nature may have a limited source of basically crude oil or, you know, easily accessible crude oil, but it has GG amounts of natural gas, meaning you're not gonna run out of it. And majority of nations have uh, like good amounts of natural gas. And it's super amazing in power generation because per unit of electricity that it produces, it produces like a very less amount of CO2 per unit of electricity compared to coal. So if you are getting, let's say 10 gigawatts of energy from coal versus getting 10 gigawatts of energy from basically methane, methane is far more preferable. So that's awesome. However, that being said, that is awesome for power generation. It this kind of sucks like for transportation meaning this puppy is not useful for transportation you cannot run your aircraft on it and like trucks and all that like again you can brute force it it's just no it's just no cost effective no it's not useful for transportation on top of that when we go through crude oil you have to understand crude oil technology meaning the fact that we can take uh, oil uh, basically crude oil and make into stuff that stuff unlocked many other industry which we never had be it plastics, be it other food additives, be it other lubrications. There is a hundreds of products, sub products that literally comes from super heavy hydrocarbon, meaning hydrocarbons that are like thick oil. So those things are very important from a nation's point of view. It's not just like, oh, we have hydrogen, uh, basically we have fuel, energy, done. No, no, you, if you have food, you need packaging. Surprisingly, large amount of packaging depend on fossil fuel products. So you have to understand that we need a boatload of paraffin wax. We need idiotically large amount of lubrication oil or sometimes also called as base oil. So whenever you see mobile and all that, what is that? It's base oil plus some additives equals whatever the heck you put in your car. So that's why gas is just one step, but we need a lot more out of it. So how do we get from this to actually useful liquids? We employ awesome technology. The technology is you take CH4 aka methane, biogas or uh, basically whatever. Uh, you make it into steam methane reforming meaning you have generally three sources. You have natural gas sources, coal gas, biomass. These are the three sources. You send it into synthogas system. So you get output wise hydrogen plus carbon monoxide. Basically you take one molecule of uh, CH4, one molecule of H2O, you get carbon monoxide and three H2. So right now if any Tom, Dick and Harry is driving hydrogen car and saying I am clean, no they are not. They are running on this. So majority of planet Earth's hydrogen supply for whatever purpose you are using, be it rocket, be it vehicles, generally come from this natural gas being steam reformed. So that's the step one. Basically you take from feedstock, you go to synth gas. Synth gas is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Then you have Fisher Trophis synthesis plant, basically this puppy. Now this puppy uh, makes sure these two things, these two couple basically, CO and H3, they get married and you have to force their marriage. So how do you force that marriage? The most thing, amazing thing for marriage is high pressure and temperature with catalyst. Catalyst controls a lot of the variables of it, but it's not consumed because it's catalyst. So it's not a consumable part. You just have to worry about pressure and temperature. And then output of it, basically you started from feedstock, you made it in a synthogas, you fissure trophies processed it. That gives you hydrocarbon chains that are very long. Now, what will be equal to? It will be equal to what we classify as hydrocarbon wax, basically liquid, and it can be used in diesel vehicle directly. And that's what in World War II was used, uh, but it's a liquid. Now, can it be run on like as is, like you take it, use it as a fuel? Yes, not ideal, but it can be done. Then it goes to third stage that is cracking and isomerization. Now be mindful, these processes are company specific, meaning what I'm talking about, I'm talking about shell company. Other companies may have a little bit different, but core logic will remain the same. So they do cracking and isomerization, basically take the hydrocarbon chain and kind of process it and then they get the right output that they are seeking. At that point in time, you have to understand this does consume energy and I mean a lot of it. So if you have a 10 megawatt of chemical energy coming in from basically methane side, LNG side or CNG side, uh, you're not gonna get 10 megawatt uh, energy output in liquid form. You're gonna get like, you know, minus 25% uh, to minus 40%. There is a very serious energy penalty that you have to understand. And this technology was developed very early on in Germany, but there was no actual user. It was like a cool, trick bro like you know cool trick but uh, during world war ii germany ran out of basically oil suppliers at that point in time they were like okay what the hell are we gonna do uh, germany was in the same state like india is right now is that we have gg amounts of coal uh, but not that much uh, fossil fuel so they literally turbocharged this process so you have two n plus one 
bracket H2 plus NCO carbon monoxide and you get CNH2N plus 2 plus NH2O basically water output and uh, it works it's a thing that was tried in war economy it works it's one of those things that does work now why the heck we don't convert all our coal into basically this well some people have actually thought, now be mindful that carbon dioxide would be emitted it's not just like voila it's not like you take coal and make it into basically methane and now you have the benefit of methane no you have the same pollution basically same carbon dioxide footprint of burning coal because again the steam reforming process takes a lot of energy and dumps carbons output so be mindful it does reduce energy so uh, grand total energy wise from an energy point of view it's generally better to if you have coal supply use coal supply as is but in some scenarios like what usa was trying uh, it's like i'm talking 10 years ago they were like very seriously looking into it and because be mindful this energy penalty became much better like back in the days it was like very very bad again it was a lab technology it was like we can do it but what's the point now it's like oh, we can actually try to do it usefully and again, some people are claiming with certain uh, temperature, pr uh, pressure and catalyst combination, they can get this very efficient, like very, very amazingly good efficiency. It can be done. So if they are stuck in a situation where USA have to be independent of OPEC, they may be like, hey, we just have our coal, convert that coal into basically kerosene. So it becomes jet propellant. And then they're like, we're good, bro. We're good. So the technology is not new, it's just understand it goes into multiple process, three process for most of the time whenever you are listening to gas to liquid technology. First step is synth gas production, second gas is Fisher Trophies product, third is cracking and isomerization and then you have your final product. So this is the core technology, nothing magical but kind of amazing that we can take light hydrocarbon, marry them into heavy hydrocarbon. Then we come to the quality aspect of it. Now, every nation, be it India, be it China, be it every Tom, Dick and Harry else, every nation is working their ass off to improve emission. I'm not talking about CO2 or H2O that is coming out of uh, basically your exhaust pipe, but things that you can see, because again, inherently, you should not be able to see water vapor, you should not be able to see uh, carbon dioxide. But then what the heck you see? These things are what you classify as soot, emission, sulfur, nitrous, basically not good things. Now, where the heck those things are coming from? Like, they cannot be just made out of thin air, especially really sulfur. Where the heck that's coming from? It's coming from fossil fuel. Whenever you are talking about fossil fuel, crude oil, crude oil has very serious amount of sulfur infused into it. Meaning, no matter what kind of processes you do, generally, you will have some sulfur uh, coming out of your, like, you know, crude oil refinement process. No matter what you do, there will be some there. And countries are trying to reduce that sulfur. Because, again, if we can reduce that sulfur exponentially, let's say there is X amount, we can drop it by, let's say, 10x, it would be amazingly clean. Even diesel vehicle will be clean. It's just that if you can get that sulfur out. Now benefit of uh, basically GTL technology because it's literally like how you get the purest form of water. You evaporate water, you condense steam. That's how you do it because that's the easiest way to leave everything behind. GTL is the same technology. So what you are getting out of natural gas well, is it contaminated? Absolutely. But is it the same level of contamination as natural gas? Hell no. Uh, basically fossil fuel? No but it's contaminated. But when you liquefy it to transport it, uh, basically LNG, LNG because of the temperature, almost no, no contamination is there. Will there be few molecules? Absolutely. Will there be like percentage wise, it will be zero. Now from that, you are doing all the processes. So you're getting clean. Basically, even your base oil that you are getting out of it, be mindful, these oils do burn in an engine, little bit, very little bit, but do burn. They do, again, piston wall is there. It's going like this. So there will be something left here, right? It will interact and that's why it consumes uh, the fuel, uh, fuel oil is consumed and lubrication oil is also consumed. So if your base oil is exponentially cleaner, the sooty output will go down exponentially less. And that does translate. They have run uh, basically experiments on it and the outcome is there are certain synthetic oil whenever you're talking about uh, that is made from basically GTL technology. It lasts four times longer compared to non-system because of the low sulfur content and contamination and they can quality control it. You are basically making the molecule so you can control it. At that point in time, even though it's twice as expensive because of the longevity, it's like, shut up and take my money. Shut up, take my money. So it's getting seriously interesting, even for companies who are like, you know, from a financial point, it does not make sense. But if you look at the holistic system analysis, it's like, hey, desirable. You, if you want to have a truck fleet and you do not want to contaminate the air, you can look into GTL, especially if you have a very large supply of natural gas, which majority of the countries do. Then we come to the naughty aspect of it, politics. Now, crude oil is the lifeblood of all nations. 
you have to understand all nations have crude oil as a background like why the heck european union did nothing in 2014 again they had no other alternative now what's the difference between 2014 and 2022 well now the european union has 20 plus percentage of renewable energy and it's growing and be mindful this is exponential growth in only last 20 years it grown from 0 percent to 22 percent so they know that in next uh, few years they can really push to 30 percent and then 40 eventually reaching 100 percent so at this point in time, whole global politics is going around crude oil. Now, crude oil itself is useless. Like if I give you crude oil, a barrel of crude oil, is it there any machine that can use it? Even large shipping containers would be like, bro, if you put this, no, just no. Even that will not work. So it's useless. But many the refined products that basically after you do crude oil distillation, the things that is what we classify as daily essential, meaning your nation can survive without electricity, cannot survive without this puppy. Daily essential, like really, really important and for multiple fields, not just energy and transportation, also for food packaging and other things also. So it's daily essential. Now, big nations, be it India, be it China, we generally invest a lot of money into refinery abilities, meaning we can just buy crude oil from Russia, crude oil from OPEX and be like done. We do not need to worry about anything other than that. And storing crude oil is uh, kind of economical also. You store crude oil and like if some days like, like there are some really high price hike, we are like, okay, let's not buy crude oil today. Let's use our repository, convert it into whatever we need and voila. So many nations do that. And again, you can notice this in uh, this war scenario where uh, Russia first there was a price cap put into crude oil. Now be mindful to make sure that OPEC does not go YOLO on us. So they were making sure that if X amount is needed to basically produce the damn thing, you must have some amount of profit. But again, if you have too much profit, Putin goes boom, boom. So to make sure Putin does not go boom, boom, you reduce the profit, not zero it, because if the moment you zero it, nobody will do work on it. So they're like enough, that enough supply is there and it also keeps OPEC in check and also reduces Russia's ability to fund the war. Now, it did not cause that much effect as people thought. Now, the reason for that is there are 200 nations on this planet. Majority of the nations do not have the ability to take crude oil, make it into liquid hydrocarbon, useful liquid hydrocarbon, be it jet fuel, be it uh, basically petrol, be it diesel, engine diesels. Uh, these things are expensive. Now, that's a second cap that has been placed, basically, I think in February that was placed and that's finally starting to impact. And you must have heard recently, uh, European people were saying now that India is like act, acting as a backdoor. That's what India was doing. India was buying crude oil and was like, hey, any nations that want uh, basically refined products, not crude oil, refined products, yes, take it and go. Refined products are far more profitable from seller's point of view. Of course, you refined it. It's useful, far more expensive. But again, crude oil already had a price cap, so India bought it and refined it and you can understand like how expensive that technology is pakistan does not have it pakistan have nukes but they cannot refine that much uh, basically of course there are some small scale but as in like take care of a nation no so many uh, so what does this mean that simply means many nations also find themselves in a stupid position where they have gas but no crude oil for example australia like it does have some like almost everywhere has some crude oil but compared to the natural gas you may be like i have one crude oil and one million natural gas that's how big difference could be so what the hell australia to do well again australia is investing a lot of money into gas to liquid technology and if they really do it like the idea is they want to develop a system that's just a gas well technology you drill a well on that platform itself you create liquid fuel be mindful with that's the easiest way to transport so if they had to transport it based on gas pipeline super expensive lng hyper expensive and uh, if they just had to make dense liquids out of it voila super easy to you so that's what they want to do and be mindful it is expensive but it is independent source of essential oil products you can replace majority of your energy from solar and wind but you cannot replace your goddamn lubrication oil and lubrication oil is not just for transportation sector many sector basically industry equals lubrication there is no scenario where you can run an industry without lubrication supply and i mean continuous supply like gg amounts of supply like train full of it kind of supply so that's the politics aspect of it. So uh, GTL technology is really, really like it's a background technology, but it's like more and more important political wise also, because again, you could be like, hey, you give me a gas pipeline rather than give me crude oil. You will, like, hey, give me gas pipeline. Then, because again, Let's say they have surplus of gas pipeline. They will sell you gas at lower price. At that point in time, GTL allows you to get everything out of it without too much hassle. Another benefit is that if let's say Australia really did this, they will not have same environmental damage as other nations did. Why? Low sulfur content. So politics is kind of interesting about this and be mindful that's why everybody loves to buy crude oil if your country is big enough and rich enough and smart enough to take crude oil and make it useful things so that's the politics aspect of it that's why gtl is the next big thing
and be mindful it can also be done with coal so if you're really pissed off with the world and you're like hey i have coal the end you can do it so what we can expect in the future now same way i talked about basically gas pipelines it's not only a technology for today because be mindful every nation is learning the hard ways that we have to switch from basically fossil fuel to renewables one simple reason for that cost stability solar farms are getting cheaper wind farms are getting cheaper the energy they are selling to the grid per basically per unit of energy uh, you know dollar per unit of energy it's getting lower while coal natural gas nuclear everything is going up so we have no other choice we have to switch into it and recent year as in like 2022 proved the whole world that that also gives you balls and every nation likes their balls so everybody is doing that now wouldn't that make all this infrastructure that we are building gas to liquid useless no it will make it awesome for us today and also for renewable future why you just have to replace the natural gas part side of it with biogas now where the heck this biogas is coming from everywhere you have human like let's say for example india how many this we have tummies we have both load of tummies 1.5 billion tummies almost that's a lot of poop that we create if you do not do anything to it you just like don't do anything to it you're still producing this puppy methane a lot of it like methane is so toxic in terms of global greenhouse uh, potential this exceeds co2 meaning by 80x if one molecule of uh, carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere how much damage it can cause multiply that by 80 that is one molecule of ch4 that's why you will always see any plant that is dealing with ch4 basically uh, biogas plants or some uh, natural gas well refinery if they have a leak their safety policy is burn it like that's how toxic this puppy is. Toxic not as in like, oh, you're gonna suffocate and all that jazz. Like it's not toxic in terms of uh, neurotoxin. It's toxic in terms of greenhouse emission. It's much brutal. That's why the potential of damage, C uh, methane is same level as CO2. Even though we are producing exponentially more CO2, methane is that brutal because everything that is biological, just I'm talking about tummies. Now let's add agriculture. Every time you twee a crop, there is waste behind it again things that you will consume that will have another cycle afterwards but the things that are attached to it those things will also decay they will also release uh, basically methane so we have to it's in our best interest from a nature's point of view to collect all of that make it into methane like as in like biogas and then run it through all this process because the output of doing it all that is rather than ch4 we have co2 and imagine a world where we still had the global warming simply because we took care of this but did not apply break on that that would be stupid like why did humanity die yeah somebody forgot uh, to worry about farts so you really don't want that so it's a very good technology that we are developing gas to liquid technologies and again you cannot run a fighter jet or jumbo jets or anything like that anything serious on anything other than super heavy hydrocarbon basically kerosene so what people are doing right now a lot of people are doing r d on low energy processing oils basically australia there is a possibility that if you do not really need a very heavy hydrocarbon let's say you do not need to go down very deep in the hydrocarbon chain you may be able to get improve the efficiency energy input and energy output exponentially much so at that point in time it's like hey if 10 megawatt came out of the ground i almost got 9 megawatt of useful diesel that would be amazing if that happens australia is just like bye you all bye they're gonna do that and selectable output for volatile market is desirable for example you may not process it you may not go to the cracking stage you may be like okay let's just take this wax store it again many countries do that whereas like they have a store and depending on the market volatility is like they're like they'll figure it out so it's a desirable thing and it's a really amazing tool for methane emission because it does not like let's say we have gg amounts of solar gg amounts of wind and we have hvdc links we are connecting uh, integrated connection and then we have pumped hydro closed loop pumped hydro so we do not have biological disaster because of it everything is sorted but again you people are still eating people are still pooping so what the hell are you gonna do you collect it you process it you make it into biogas what the hell you do with biogas you generate energy out of it that's the cheapest thing to do but then it leads a point it's like hey sun is already producing energy wind is already producing energy again this will act as a buffer then you also have pumped hydro as a buffer what the hell you do you convert it into stable long-term storable things so you instead of like oh in winters what the hell we're gonna do it's like dude we have enough fuel don't worry about it and it can pile up over years 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 you can keep doing it so that's why it's amazing technology to develop not only for fossil fuel era also for renewable era because we have to take care of this puppy this is a naughty puppy we have tiny emission but this puppy is very naughty so this was my presentation on basically gas to liquid technology hopefully you have liked it learned from it in that case please see the like button share it amongst your friend that will help me a lot if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it i urge you to press dislike press it twice to show me extra disappointment please leave a comment because i do try to reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you're free and as always thanks for watching